Well, welcome everybody. We have welcome those of you who are here in um, the Warner Library, and for those of you who are out there in um, uh, in Zoom, the internet. Um, my name is John Nordloff, Dr. Nordloff. I am the writing specialist here at Eastern University on the St. David's campus, and um, I am joined here by my colleague Chelsea Post. And we started last year doing some joint library writing center um, workshops dealing with topics on writing and um, and research. Um, so our first one for this year is going to be on APA format, the key concepts for the workshop. We're gonna focus on how to format a quotation or paraphrase using a signal phrase, and then also how to format a reference entry for an article or book um, in APA style. So that's those are the specific things that I will try to cover. Um, as we start here, let me just mention that um, I think this is, we, I know these sessions are always, I've done APA workshops for years and years here at Eastern. And one of the reasons um, that I think they always seem to fill up is that um, this is one of the new, kind of one of the new things for students as they come in to college. And it's not just here at Eastern. Um, and I say that because a lot of times students um, who, are, who are coming from high school, typically, your writing um, assignments tend to be in English class or history class, um, and in which case they're probably using definitely in English and probably in history. If you're being asked to document, you're probably using MLA style. And so you're probably familiar with that um, in some way or another. When you get to college, many of you um, come in, may, maybe you take Psych 100 your freshman year, and suddenly they say, write it in APA style, and students go, ah. And it's a little, it's a little scary. It can feel a little scary. And so, um, and so we're going to kind of try to make, I'm going to try to make some connections to MLA. One of the things that I find is that APA style is not all that different in its structure than MLA style. There's a lot of similarities actually. And well, I'll try to point those out as we go, but there are some, there are some differences. And, um, and so we wanna make sure we're aware of that and aware of how to address those, okay? So we're gonna, what we're gonna do to start off, I'm gonna give a little overview by looking at a sample paper here and, and I'll kind of talk through some things about ML or APA style, and then we'll go and we'll look at, I'll, I'll go over those things in a little bit more detail. Okay, so I am here, if we, if we can see this, I am here actually on what's known as the APA style page. And in fact, if you Google APA style, you're probably gonna get this website. It's, it actually is by APA, which is, by the way, which it stands for the American Psychological Association. So this is like the professional organization for psychology professors. So if you're writing for your psychology class, they're definitely gonna ask you to use this style. But what we found over the years, the style has become more, um, more dominant in other fields. So for example, if you're a nursing major, you might very well, you're gonna be asked to write in APA style. And, and if you're a social work major, you're probably gonna be asked. There's quite a few. In fact, I'm in writing center studies and believe it or not, our main journal a few years ago said, we're moving from an MLA style to APA style. So it's all over the place. We're gonna look at a couple of things in here. This is a sample student paper and this is everything that I am talking about here is APA style seventh edition. Now we've been around, the seventh edition came out, I think it's now almost three years ago. I think it was 2019 maybe that it came, that it came out. So it's been around for a little while, but just so you're aware of that, um, there have been some changes that sometimes people haven't caught up to. Um, one of them is that for student papers, they ask you, um, to document, you can see how it has the page number at the top right. Nothing else is needed for the header in the student version of APA style, so you're aware. But now we're gonna take a look at a few things here. APA typically gets a, papers get a title page and you can see, you can see some of the information there, the student, the, the title of the um, paper centered and bold-faced then Below that, so the student name, the course, the instructor, the date, 
um, are all things that would appear on the title page. And then you reprint the title on the beginning of your first page of text. You can see that there. So those are some small things. Now we're gonna focus on things. As I said, we're gonna focus for this presentation mainly on how to do in-text citation for, um, for books and journals, and then how to set up some of your references. Um, specific, I'll focus on books and journal articles, but, um, but obviously there are many different kinds of references you might have. Now, the basic thing here, I said I would connect this to MLA. Um, this is, this, is this in-text citation format works very similarly to what you would be familiar with from MLA, which is that when you're reading a paper, you're going to be given a key piece of information, which is the author name. Um, and that author name tells you um, when it's given in the context of a quotation or a reference, it tells you that's where I would look for, um, I, that I could look for that person's name on the references at the end and find that information. And so, okay, so here, for example, on page four of this, um, we see here, for a, this is about the middle of the page. For example, Holden Lund, 1988, examined the effects of a guided Im imagery intervention. Okay, so we have this name, Holden Lund examined. Now that is, um, that, that's, that tells me that I'm going to be able to find that information, more information on that writer at the end of the document. So I should be able to go to the end and alphabetically, I should find Holden Lund. And sure enough, I do. You can see there on page 11, alphabetized, we see here Holden Lund, comma C, effects of real relaxation with guided imagery, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now I could now, now I could actually go to that um, to that article based on that information there. So that that basic movement, author name in text to references, we call it references in APA style. I know in MLA they call it works cited. So we go author name to references alphabetized. That's the basic move in APA style. So if you're familiar with that, you've kind of got the big picture of what we're doing um, documentation wise. It's pretty simple. What's not as simple is that is sort of how we format it a little bit. There's some, there's some different formatting um, procedures for APA style. So I'm gonna go back here um, to um, the top here. First of all, what we see here is a combination what we saw there is what, what in MLA or APA we call a narrative citation. When, when we say in the text, you know, according to Jones or Smith said, that kind of thing, we call that a narrative citation. The other kind of citation we could find is a parenthetical citation. And that's where we have a quotation or a reference. And then after the reference, we see in parentheses, the author name or names of authors. So you can see here, um, you can see here on that second paragraph, this citation to um, Yalom and Lesk. We see that in parentheses. Now, so that's the other, so that's the parenthetical citation. You can do either one depending on the context. And you can see one of the things with the parenthetical citation, sometimes you could put more than one citation. Sometimes we refer to a couple of different sources together, and you can do that in parentheses. Now, notice either way, whether it's in that parenthetical citation or whether it was in um, the narrative citation, we used the year of publication appeared after the author's name. And that's a consistent feature in APA style, and one of the main things that differentiates it from MLA style. And why do we do that? Um, why, or, why do they do that in APA? Um, I think it's a basic difference in the documentation styles all have a little bit of the flavor of the discipline that they represent. And this is an example of how APA represents its discipline in, a, in psychology in a little bit different way than MLA, which is talking about literature 
In which case, is the date important for a work of literature? Not necessarily. Is it important that, that Hamlet by William Shakespeare was written in 16, 1599? I think it was. Is that important? Maybe, but it's it's sort of in some ways it's a little bit timeless. We we treat it um, we treat it on its own terms. Scholarly research in the social sciences, like like psychology, is different. Um, if I see that a work, for example, that here's a citation from on the bottom, the top paragraph from White, two thousand. Okay, now is two thousand. A long time ago, actually, now that I'm looking around at the room, that might be older than, than many of the people watching this um, presentation, right? Um, and what it tells me is actually that, that that research is at least, it's over two decades old. It might be great research, but we know that in most fields, a couple of decades more research has come out, which is probably better because it's more comprehensive. So, Having that year of publication in the text is kind of is going to be a key feature to um, to APA style because it um, it gives us a quick indicator as a reader to how current that research is. And believe it or not, I know for a student that might not affect you that much, but as you as you develop your knowledge in a field, you're going to start to know what the scholarship is and you'll start to be aware oh you know what that's interesting but i know that they didn't they must you know they couldn't have read jones because jones was published in 2010 10 years later okay so we can see here so so the big thing i'm going to point out here is we're going to see these references in text um, either narrative you know according to jones and then or in parentheses um, but either way, we're going to have that year of publication right next to it. When it's the narrative, you're going to see that in, parenth in parentheses, Jones 2000, White 2000. And in, when, it's, when the whole thing is in parentheses, then you put a comma between the name and that. Okay. And then you see just a couple other things I'm going to point out here. If we skip down, the references appears at the end. Again, this is just like MLA, except we call it references instead of works cited. And also we have, you, you notice it's formatted using what we call a hanging indent. And what that means is it, it really means that you have an indent. It's exactly the opposite of our normal paragraph indent where you normally a paragraph, you indent the first line, five spaces and everything else is flush left. For APA references, just like with MLA works cited, we have the first line flush left of each entry. And then after that, every line is five spaces indented for that one entry. And you can see, when you look at it, you can see why they do that because what we're looking to do is to find works alphabetized on the references page. And you notice when you do this hanging indent, it makes it really easy to see the author's last name, okay? Notice also everything is double spaced. Again, this is this is consistent with um, MLA format. Well, we're going to look at some specific aspects of entries here, but you notice here that it has a lot of the new ver the new version of APA um, asks you to use hyperlinks in your text when you have um, web based um, documentation, which which is more and more is what what we have um, and. In fact, here in the library, we used to have a whole bunch of print journals, and now it's everything we access now is on is online. So, um, so that's what we're going to find. And I'm going to mention a couple of other things here. Regarding since you brought up the author question, let me just mention a couple of other things here. You can see here in now this is on page what is this page? Oh, probably page seven here. You can see that citation of Cohen and Freed. There's some basic, when you're citing authors, what the other thing that we're finding is that in the sciences and social sciences, more often, more and more often, you're citing multiple authors. In my field, you know, in English, it's typically single authored, maybe double authored works. Um, but in the sciences and social sciences, oftentimes it's two, three, four, sometimes six or 10 or more authors. 
Um, just so you know, when you're citing, um, APA has a way to do that that is, is relatively simple, but you know, I'll explain it here. If you have one or two authors like Cohen and Freed, we cite those two authors, you know, the one author that, or both authors every time. But if it gets a little bit beyond that, like let's say there's let's say there's three or more authors. In that case, what you do, okay, here's one guided imagery have been shown, et cetera, et cetera. Schweitz et al. And that's an, a Latin abbreviation, ET space AL period. That just means and others. And that's what you do. If it's three or more authors, you're going to cite Schweitz et al. With the one and two authors, um, when it's a parenthetical, we say, you know, for example, Bernstein and Borkovitz, A and D, Bernstein, A and D, Borkovic. If it is in those parentheses, this is one of these kind of annoying things, but you can see up at the top here on page three, Ute and Miller, but they use that ampersand, which is that little curly Q symbol. Okay, it just means and, um, but that's what they do in the, um, in the parenthetical citations. You'll also see that's what they do. We use that when we have multiple authors in, um, in the references, you always include that ampersand before the last author that's listed there. And you're gonna list all of the authors, the references, even though you've said et al, because there's three or more authors, when you refer them, refer them in text, you use all of the authors up to 20, I believe. So for the most part, you're gonna use all the authors when you cite them in the references, okay? So let's look here. And I'm going to just do a little overview. I know I looked at the that sample paper. And now we're going to look at, um, I'm going to kind of go over some of that in a little bit more detail. So first of all, in-text citation, like MLA. So again, author's last name. That's going to tell you where to go alphabetically in the references. So that basic movement of you see a reference by, you know, the in-text, either a parenthetical or narrative citation. And now I know it's Jones, so I can go to Jones in the references, okay? Um, it includes author and page number, if, if possible. We'll talk about, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment here, um, either in signal phrase or uh, narrative phrase or in parentheses, reference list at the end. Okay, one other thing that I'll mention here, unlike MLA style, we don't include the first names of the authors that we cite. Um, and you'll kind of, you might notice that as a difference here um, when, you're, when you're citing. So rather than saying, you know, according to Steven Pinker, let's say um, in psychology, you might just say according to Pinker. Um, and, then in the tech, and then in the references, you include their initials. So Pinker comma S period, okay. APA doesn't say a lot about that. I think it might be as a kind of a it it one thing that we get from first names or possibly get is is a is gender identification. Many many names, not all, are gendered um, or have implications. So it's it might be a way of of kind of limiting sort of the possibility of gender bias. Um, okay, so you can see here an example of an in-text, a parenthetic or a narrative citation here. Yanofsky and Yanofsky, 2002, reported that, quote, the current state of treatment of obesity is similar to the state, treat, state of treatment of hypertension several decades ago, page 600, okay? I'll say a few words about this. First of all, you can see, again, the authors. Here we have two authors. We're including both of them because it's, a, because it's that narrative citation in text, we're going to use the AND. We have the year of publication, 2002. And again, that's really useful because again, it tells us they, they're using the phrase current state of uh, treatment for obesity. Again, we know that's exactly 10 or 20 years old. So if I'm reading that, I might say, well, okay, that's interesting information. I might, but I could I can put it into some context based on what I might know about the treatment of obesity now, okay? This is a quotation, and I'll say a word about that. Typically, if you have a quotation, you're going to include, you know, do include the page number, 
Um, but what we do, I will mention this here. I said that there are, you know, differences, you know, different styles um, tend to focus, you know, disciplines have different focuses and, and sort of procedures for research. Typically, if you're writing in the sciences or social sciences, which are most of the papers that you're going to be using APA for, you're probably going to be um, summarizing or paraphrasing material more than you quote. Um, and the reason for that, you know, I'm again, you know, came up as an English major. I was quoting all the time. I still like to quote as, as my, that's sort of my way of doing research in many ways, but it reflects, it reflects a discipline that is focused on the text itself as the object of my examination. In other words, when I'm writing about, um, you know, if I'm writing about George Eliot's Middlemarch, a novel from the 19th century, my evidence is that text. Now, typically when you're in the sciences or social sciences, you might be quoting a study. You're actually more interested in the results of the study than the actual words that the writer used to express it. So you're gonna probably be paraphrasing, trying to put it in your own words. And that is another one of the challenges for writers in APA style as to how to, you know, you wanna make sure that you're expressing the ideas clearly, but in your own words, okay? You do not need um, typically to put a page number for those kind of citations, okay? Um, now then we see here, I'll go over this, but you can see an example here of the citation of Yanofsky and Yanofsky 2002. And we'll go over that in a little more detail. One of the things that we're gonna find is that, for example, uh, you're going to be treating, I'm gonna show you in a moment here, how to cite a journal article. Typically, even though you're finding it on the web, we're not going to treat we're going to treat it as a journal article, and that's and so and so in those in most of those cases, you will actually have page numbers if you are if you are using them. And again, okay. So again, and just just a couple words about paraphrase. Again, paraphrase borrows ideas from another writer, but puts the ideas in your own words, whereas quotation borrows words directly from another writer. And you put the words of quote in quotation marks are found are exactly as found in the source. Now, the big thing that I wanted to mention here is that whether you're quoting or paraphrasing, you want to make sure to acknowledge that outside source. Okay, and it, it looks almost the same. Again, the difference is that you're not going to have the quotation marks for paraphrase, and you're not going to include uh, page numbers. Okay. Again, you can see here these are examples of paraphrase, and you can see again, you know. Baumrind insisted, notice its author's name, followed by that, that um, by, it, by the year of publication in parentheses. So that's really important, having that year of publication next to the author's name. And then you see here an example of, of a parenthetical citation where you see one critic insisted that the subject should have been completely informed, Baumrind comma 1968. Likewise, quotations follows a similar pattern. Again, fairly similar to MLA in that if you, when you include the page number, you're going to do it after the quotation. So you have the end quotes and then you have the page number. You do include this notice that P period or before the page number, that's a little different. If it's multiple pages, you would do PP period. Okay. Okay, we're gonna take a look here now at an article, we're gonna talk a little bit about this here. And I'm gonna go over just a few things with you here, just so you can kind of get a handle on this. So this is an article with a digital object identifier. And this is gonna be, if you're public, if you're writing in the sciences and social sciences, this is, this is going to be the most likely form of reference that you're going to be using. And, and I'll, I'll say this, and I'll say it a slightly different way. It's the most likely reference that you probably should be using in most cases for good, um, for good research that you're doing in, um, for your classes that are in the sciences and social sciences. And why do I say that? What I'm citing here is an article in a journal, in a, in a, in a research journal. And in, in terms of the quality of research um, that you're looking at getting for 
college level assignments, this is going to be kind of our gold standard. It's true, it's true for professionals as well. And the reason for that is a couple of things. One is that typically the, the most recent research in, in most fields comes out in journal articles. If you go here, I mean, and, and I love I love a good book just like anybody. I know Chelsea does as well. But we, we know that most of the books that we see on the shelves are usually older material because if even if it has serious scholarship, oftentimes an author will take, in, in my field, they might write four or five journal articles and then they'll put it together in a book later on. And in other fields, in the sciences, typically they won't do that at all. They'll just, the books that we see on the shelves will typically be more like popular books, books that are written to sort of address a kind of a, a more popular, but the journal articles, that's that's kind of where it's at. And um, those are things that you're going to be finding using the databases here. So if you're, if you hear your instructors encouraging to you, you to use EBSCOhost or JSTOR, or some of the other sources here, that's because they're going to make it easy for you to find those things. More so than if you do a, like just a Google search and find things on on the web. A lot of times that will lead you to information that might not be so reliable. Okay, so here we have, just gonna go through a few things here. We can see here, we start with the author's name, last name, followed by a comma, and then their first initial or initials, okay? So even though, and you're gonna, and I'll mention this here, even though when you look at the article, you say, well, it says, Whit, you know, it says John Michael Whitmire, let's say. I don't know what the person's name is. But let's just say it's John. You're still going to use the initial because that's the format that we're doing here. So what? So the things that I'm showing you here, even though you might say it's a little bit different um, punctuation-wise or capitalization in the article itself, you need to format it using this format. Okay, so first initials, and then we put the year of publication in parentheses, followed by period. Then we have the title of the article itself. And you can see here, this uses um, this kind of funny um, capitalization. We capitalize the first letter and everything else is lowercase. There are some exceptions there with the titles you, you would capitalize if there was a proper noun like Washington DC, you would capitalize it just like normal. And if I have a colon, a lot of a lot of journal articles like they they have colons in them to separate the beginning from the end. A lot of times they'll have a kind of something that's a little more colorful at the beginning, but then after the colon, they're going to be really specific about what they're doing. Capitalize the first letter after that. Otherwise, it's lowercase, no quotation marks around it. That's a difference from MLA style. And then we have a period, and then in italics, that kind of that kind of shifty. Um, font, we have the title of the journal article or the journal itself, social science research. We italicize it. We capitalize it just like it would appear on the cover of the journal. So the major letters, the major words, the first letters capitalized, followed by a comma. And then we have a string of numbers. And let me just interpret those for you. The first number here is 29. And that's in that's in italics again after the after the comma. That is the volume. And the volume of a work is it's like one year's worth of those journals. So like so like volume 29 is probably everything that came out, all of the issues of that journal that came out in 2000, I'm imagining. And then in parentheses, the next number there is the, the actual issue. Which means, like, back, it's it's a little harder for me to explain these things now because it's all digital. But it used to be that the library would get an issue every you know every three months or whatever, and it would come in and then they put them together into a volume. But that's the issue. We put that in parentheses. Um, when you're looking for that information on the article itself, sometimes it appears as the number. Or, and this is a little more confusing, <laughs> number is sometimes is abbreviated as NO period, but it means number. It's all the same thing, issue, number, NO period, the same thing. Then we have the comma and then we have the, the page numbers. The last thing here is what we call the DOI. And I was gonna say a word about that. 
So DOI is Digital Object Identifier. What that is, is a sort of a, it's almost like a barcode for journal articles so that you can find that information reliably on the internet. And what, what do I mean by reliably? Well, you know how it is when you're looking, you go to a website and you, and you think, oh, that's really interesting. I'll go back and then you go back tomorrow and it's gone or the link doesn't work. Um, so um, scholars decided in the sciences and social sciences, let's make a kind of a permanent reference to that source. And they created the system called the DOI. So that's what that string of numbers the format is it all they all start off with this https colon slash slash doi.org slash. And then you're going to find in all of the references that have one of these, it's going to have this string of numbers and letters that begins with 10. And you're going to you so you append that to that first part, https, et cetera. And you got yourself a DOI. And you should be, I should be able to click on that and go to the source itself. We have here an example of a book and I, sh I show this and again, I know less, we're, we're citing books less and less, but just so you know, it's kind of similar to a, a journal entry. You put the author's name, a last name, comma, first initial, the year of publication. And then we put the title of the work italicized, but also with that same lowercase principle as we did for the title of the journal article. So you, you, you have lowercase for, uh, for everything except for the first letter, first letter of the colon, proper names. And then the last thing that we include here is the publisher itself. Older editions, we used to have to include the location of the publisher, was, which was always a little complicated to explain, so I'm glad not to have to do that anymore. One thing I'll mention with this is yes, you might not use physical books, but we do have ebooks, and the ebooks do tend to be more recent publishes. Um, mm -hmm. Not nearly as, as recent as a journal article might be, but they definitely are much more up to date than yeah. a lot of the physical ones that we have on the shelves, at least for the types of sources that you would use for APA. Yeah. So, in cases like that, Ebook citations, I believe, follow this very similarly, but the only extra thing is that it too will have a DOI that you just would tack on at the end. Everything else would remain the same. So FYI, if you if you're interested in in visiting, as I said before, I direct the writing center here. If you're interested in in um, um, finding, you know, visiting us, we are available um, in a couple of different formats. And let me just, I'm going to kind of. If you just go to our web, uh, to the Eastern website and type in Writing Center, you're gonna get a link here. And just a couple of things for those of you who are traditional undergraduate students here at the Eastern campus, we have appointments. You follow the instructions here. If you set up an, an account with our WC online page, um, you can you can access the, the calendar system for, for traditional undergraduate students. For grad and non-traditional, Traditional undergraduate students, we have um, we have our uh, our online writing assistant Ruby who can work with you, and you have, there's instructions here on how to make appointments with Ruby. So so please do um, visit us. Okay. Well, again, um, thank you for coming. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop here. Um, if you're if you're here in the room, you're welcome to um, you know stick around and ask questions. Otherwise, you're free to go. And um, and we'll see you. Uh, we'll send out. Chelsea, we have some more workshops coming out. We'll send out a reminder of what the, of what those are because as we were just talking about that, we're, yep, we'll both, but Chelsea, next. yeah, next we're going to do one in October and one in November. So um, so keep an eye out for those. Okay.